Well, good morning. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5. If you're new to the Bible and not quite sure where to find Acts, it comes at the beginning of what's called the New Testament. So our Bible is divided into two main sections. The Old Testament, which is about two-thirds of the, of the entire Bible. And then the New Testament, which starts with those four stories about the Lord Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And Acts is right next door to John. And we're going to be in chapter 5 of the book of Acts. Now last week... Um, we started our way through uh, chapter 5, and I said this was going to be the beginning of a two-part series. So uh, we're going to return again to um, the story that we have here in Acts chapter 5 and focus specifically on verses 41 and 42. And last week I, I made an application how the unstoppable gospel... The unstoppable gospel shaped the apostles' attitude and should also shape ours. Because what we're going to find in Acts chapter 5, as we saw last week, is that the, gospels, the, the, the apostles believed that the gospel of Jesus Christ was unstoppable. No human institution, no demonic force was going to be able to, to stop or control or cease the progress of the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so in terms of, of points of application, we said that, that the apostles displayed an attitude of absolute confidence, absolute confidence in the triumph of Christ's cause and kingdom. And secondly, they also displayed resilient joy, resilient joy in the cause and kingdom of Christ despite... Temporary persecutions, trials, and setback. And so last week, we, we camped out on point one and talked about what it means to have absolute confidence in the triumph of Christ's cause and kingdom. Today, we're going to come back to point number two. To point number two. And talk about how did these apostles have a resilient joy in Christ and in Christ's cause despite persecution despite trials, and despite setback. And what can we, today as modern day believers, what can we learn from them about our own attitude, our own perspective about trials and persecution and setbacks that we're experiencing today in our own culture? So with that said, friends, I want to invite you to pray with me as we ask for the Holy Spirit's help to enlighten us, to understand the text, and also understand uh, what God would want to speak to us this day. So please pray with me. Father, we thank you for another time to open up your word and to learn from your holy word about our lives and our life together as a church. And we pray specifically, Holy Spirit, that you would instruct us from this account that you've given us here in Acts chapter 5 about how your apostles... The sent ones, the first ambassadors of the Lord Jesus, how they endured and thrived in the midst of persecution, setbacks, and trials. How they had a resilient joy in the midst of what they were going through. So Holy Spirit, please show us how they did that, and we ask that you would instill in us the same joy, the same resilience, the same optimism that they had in the cause of Christ. And we want all of this for the, your sake, Lord Jesus, because we want to honor you and glorify you. And our desire is that you would be seen by all and that we would be your witnesses, filled with your spirit in the same way that they were. So do a good work among us this morning. We ask Jesus in your name. Amen. Well, friends, last week we talked about some of the struggles that we are uh, encountering right now as the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of our culture here in America. We talked about different ideologies that are out there, secular ideologies that are in some ways infiltrating the church, but also infiltrating other areas of our society. 
We talked about um, the civil unrest that we're experiencing with protests and uh, mob violence. We talked about the mental health crisis that is uh, afflicting many young people as well as um, all levels of, of, of ages in our, in our society and, and the pressure that there is on the church, the social pressure that there is on the church with a growing hostility, a growing public hostility against traditional Christianity. I gave you a quote from uh, one writer who, who said this, a progressive and profoundly anti-Christian militancy is steadily overtaking society, taking material form in government and private institutions, in corporations, in academia and media, and in the changing practices of everyday American life. It is empowered by unprecedented technological capabilities to surveil private life and he's concluded with this, there is virtually nowhere left to hide. In other words, there's a growing hostility towards traditional Christianity that is empowered by government and powerful corporations with the use of technology, and there's nowhere left for Christians to hide. In other words, to avoid this growing conflict that there is with a culture that is becoming more and more hostile towards Christianity. And many of us feel this. We, we, we feel a sense of, of, of fear. We feel a, a sense of dread. Uh, we are worried about the next generation. We're worried about our own children. And there's, this, there's this, this pressure that is beginning to build around Christians and around Christian institutions. And we all are, are in it and wondering if we're going to survive, if the church is going to survive. And, and along with that comes a sense of defeatism. And pessimism, pessimism, pessim that word, yes, you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> to where we just, we feel a sense of hopelessness about our future. And I, I shared with you an example of what, how that hopelessness can manifest itself in our discourse and how we talk. I shared about uh, a conversation um, that I had with someone in my church many years ago who felt sorry for parents in this generation, who felt bad for parents trying to raise kids in this ungodly culture. And I shared with you how I challenged that statement and said, that's actually an atheistic statement because you're speaking as if there is no God. And particularly, you're speaking as if there's a God that, that does not raise the dead. And that's not what we believe. We believe in a God that brings new life, that raises dead things back to life. So there's always hope. And one of the most hopeful things we can do as Christians is raise children in the fear of the Lord and in instruction of Jesus Christ, knowing and trusting that God will use them to pass on the baton of the gospel to the next generation. So there's always hope, but it doesn't always feel that way. There's a, a writer, I've shared with this, um, this with you before, so some of you have probably heard me talk about this. Some of you might even be familiar with these, these concepts that I'm going to introduce. But we are going to come back to this again and again throughout the book of Acts because it's, very, it's, it's a helpful paradigm to understand our current context as well as the context of the book of Acts. And that is um, um, what's called the three worlds of evangelicalism. The three worlds of evangelicalism. There's a, a writer, a thinker named Aaron Wren, uh, R-E-N-N, -N, if you want to Google him. Uh, he's actually got a book coming out this next year on this, on this concept of, of uh, what he calls negative world of evangelicalism. And I find it helpful. Um, again, it, there's, it, it's a broad, it's a, it's a broad, uh, paint a broad brush, broad, broad, you know what I'm saying. I can't talk today. I'm sorry. It's, it's been a long week. So broad strokes uh, um, analysis. So th there's, there's discrepancies and things I would, you know, nuances I would disagree with in what he's saying here. But I, I think he's on to something. And so Wren says that there's three different phases that we've seen of evangelicalism um, coming out of our American society over the course of the last uh, several decades. And so he calls positive world, positive world pre-1994, and describes it this way. He says, Christianity was viewed, generally speaking, positively by society, and Christian morality was still normative. To be seen as a religious person and one who exemplifies traditional Christian norms was a social positive. Christianity was a status enhancer. In some cases, failure to embrace Christian norms hurts you. 
Okay, so it's seen as a, as a positive thing to adhere towards um, what we would consider moral or Christian behavior. However, there was a shift, a shift in society's perspective that he traces from 1994 up to 2014. He calls this neutral world. In a neutral world, uh, Wren argues that Christianity is seen as a socially neutral attribute. It is no longer, uh, no longer had dominant status in society, but to be seen as a religious person was not a knock either. It was more like a personal affectation or hobby. Christian moral norms retained residual force, so it was almost like, you can believe what you believe, that's fine, I'll believe what I believe, that's fine, and, and we'll just sort of kind of coexist together. He said that was sort of the, the mentality coming through the 90s into the early 2000s. However, he says there's been a decisive shift since 2014. And he traces that there's a number of political things and institutional things that happened around that time that he teases out and says, describing why the shift happened. But he says, basically, that this new shift to what he calls negative world is still ongoing with us and will be the, the dominant world that evangelicals will be living in. And he describes negative world this way. In this world, being a Christian is now a social negative, especially in high-status positions. Christianity, in many ways, is seen as undermining the social good, and Christian morality is expressly repudiated. In other words, to be a Christian and to hold on to traditional views of morality and of, and of, and of orthodoxy is seen as a negative thing. In fact, you, be, you become a suspicious person, okay? A person of interest. Not a good kind of person of interest, but someone to be suspicious of, to watch out for, because to be this kind of a person, to hold these kind of opinions, means that you are undermining the social good of society. In other words, you're a bad citizen. Now, our culture puts a high emphasis on being a good human being, being a kind person. So you'll see bumper stickers that say, be kind. Um, you see T-shirts that people wear that say, be a good human being. And that's just kind of the, the discourse that, that, that's often used in our culture, to be a good person, a good human. Well, most of the time, in our media at least, Christians are rarely described in those terms. Kind, good, good human being, inclusive, and whatnot. In fact, Christians are deemed as the enemy of that which is good, the enemy of kindness, the opposite of those things. And this is life now in negative world. And Wren says that what worked in positive world and neutral world will not work in negative world, and Christians need to learn a new set of skills in order to thrive in a situation where there is growing hostility towards Christian morality and Christian ideas. Now, what makes Wren's analysis here important for us in terms of the book of Acts, this is exactly the kind of world that the apostles were in. This is the kind of world that we're going to see them inhabit. In fact, later on, as we continue our way through Acts, when, it, when the gospel moves out into the, to the Greco-Roman world, they're gonna, you're going to find that they were called bad citizens. They were highly suspicious because the apostles and the early church would not bow their knee to Caesar and would not adhere to Greco-Roman nor norms. And because of that, they were considered a threat to society a threat to the state, a threat to the, the social fabric and the good of, of, of the people, of the common will of the people. So we're seeing some parallels between our situation and the book of Acts. Now, we're not in a situation that right now where our lives are at risk for, the, for, uh, for Christ in our society. There's still some semblance of religious freedom, but even that is being questioned. So to be a Christian, a professing public Christian in negative world will become more costly, more risky, and require probably a new set of, of, of skills and understanding how we're going to be able to thrive in such an environment. Now I think, um, I'm guessing that many of you would probably say, yeah, you, you feel this tension that's growing now in our society. You feel what it's like to be in this negative world. What, what Ren is describing here, I think, probably resonates with, uh, with many of you. Now, the concern that I have and the thing that we must avoid at all costs 
is what we talked about last week, this deep sense of pessimism that can come with being in a negative world, a sense of defeatism, a sense of, a sense of that everything is just going to get worse and worse, and the best we can do, the best we can hope for is just to somehow hunker down and just hold on to the end until Jesus comes back again. And I want to suggest to you, friends, that that's not the way that the apostles worked in their own negative world. And, not what, and that's not what God would have us do in our own negative world and our culture either. In fact, we're going to find from our text this morning that it's just the opposite. That it's just the opposite. We're going to find that the apostles had, as we saw last week, a, an absolute confidence in the progress of the gospel and resilient joy, even in the face of persecution and setbacks. So let's, um, let's recap the story and come back down and focus on verses 41 and 42. So for those of you who weren't here last week, or those of you that forget sermons between, you know, Sundays, I know a lot of things go on during the week, so I'm not shaming you if you forgot the sermon. Um, Hopefully you remember some of it. But we were, telling, we were seeing how the, uh, the temple leadership begins to put more pressure on the apostles and eventually arrests them and puts them into, uh, puts them into uh, to prison. Um, and so while they are uh, imprisoned, an angel of the Lord comes and sets them free uh, during the night. And the angel's instructions to them is this, go back into the temple courts and keep on speaking the words of this life. In other words, keep preaching about Jesus. So the next day, uh, the temple, uh, members of the temple leadership, you know, they come marching down the halls. They've got their attire on and all their, their pomp and airs put on to threaten these poor apostles in prison. They, uh, you know, they have the guards open the prison door and poof, nobody's in there. It's like that twilight zone moment, right? Like do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. And they look at the guards and the guards just shrug and say, hey, we've been here all night. Like nobody's come out of here. And then, they, and then someone else comes running down the hall and, and calls to them and says, look, 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 they're back again. They're out in the temple courts preaching right now. And so the, you know, the poor temple leadership is just pulling their hair out saying, how is this even possible? So they go outside and there the apostles are again, preaching and teaching in the temple courts as if nothing had ever happened. So they pull them aside, warn them to quit speaking in the name of this, uh, in this man's name, the name of Jesus. Peter, of course, says it is better to obey God than to obey you. And so, um, so they, are, they are beaten and flogged. Now, in the midst of this, one of their own steps up. One of their own steps up. And he says, be careful what you do with these men. Because this may be... Um, he, and he uses some illustrations of some other Jewish revolutionaries that had, that had passed. He said, if this is of man, it will fail. But if this is of God, it won't fail. So he, they, he, they get a warning to be careful in how they're treating, treating these apostles because this might be something of God. Now, in the midst of their being flogged and beaten, they, uh, the, the apostles come back. In verse 1, it says this. Uh, verse 41 of chapter 5 says, Then they left the presence of the council. They left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Verse 42 And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching about uh, teaching and preaching that Jesus, uh, that, that, sorry, that the Christ is Jesus. All right, so they're warned, they're beaten, they go back, and they rejoice. And then they go back the next day, and they keep on doing it. So where did they get this from? Where did they get this confidence? And how did they get this, this resilient joy in the midst of political pressure and persecutions? So our main point that we had last week is the same as today. God's unstoppable gospel that the apostles believed in should fill Christians today with confidence and joy as they proclaim Christ to a hostile world. So what I want to do now is go back to application number two and do what we call theological reflection with you. 
theological reflection and ask the question, okay, how do Christians living in negative world cultivate the same resilient joy that the early church possessed? How do we, as modern day Jesus followers, cultivate the same kind of resilient joy that these early Christians possessed in the midst of persecution, suffering, trials, and setback. And I want to suggest three things. Three things, just very, very practically. Three things that they, that the early church did, that the early church believed, that the early church thought, that we also are called to, to model, to follow, and to, to embody ourselves. And my hope is that, um, that we will take these things to heart and realize that in the midst of our own struggles and our own trials and all the negativity that we're bombarded with every single day in our 24-hour media cycle, that that's a perspective. That is a perspective on what's happening. But it's not the ultimate perspective. We need to look at things from God's perspective, from his divine word's perspective, and the early church, I believe, gives us God's perspective on how to face trials and what is actually happening when the church is undergoing struggle, setbacks, and persecution. So here are my three ingredients for you. Three ingredients for cultivating resilient joy based on what we see in the text and in the New Testament. First and foremost, the early church joyfully prioritized the mission of Jesus over all other political and social matters. Their priority was the mission of Jesus above everything else. Now, sometimes we forget that what we see here in Scripture actually happened in history. And that there is a, a social and historical and cultural context that the apostles were living in. At this point in the story, it was still a primarily Jewish church. The Gentiles don't start coming in until the next couple of chapters. We're going to see over the next few weeks how the gospel is going to break out of the area of Jerusalem and move into greater Judea, then to Samaria, and eventually into the Gentile world. But we're not there yet. It's still primarily a Jewish church. And these first century Jews, these apostles had very strongly held political and theological positions. Okay? The world of ancient Judaism was looking towards a Messiah, was looking for someone to throw off Roman oppression, was looking for the renewal of the temple, and was looking for the total defeat of God's enemies and the restoration of Israel as a nation. Remember the question that they asked Jesus. The first question they asked the Lord Jesus after the resurrection, we saw this in chapter 1, was, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's a very Jewish question to ask. That was on the forefront of their minds because that was their belief and their ultimate hope. And remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but you... You will be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus raises their vision, their understanding to new heights and says your ultimate priority will no longer be your own people, your own nation, but it's going to be my priority of all the nations. You see? So we're going to find as Acts progresses that there's this tension that happens in the early church between remaining a Jewish church or becoming a church for all people. And the key issue that's going to be dividing the early church is circumcision. Circumcision. Now I know most of you probably don't wake up in a cold sweat over whether or not uncircumcised Gentiles can come to the church. Right? Like, you don't even think about it. But before there were debates about the divinity of Jesus, before there were debates about the inerrancy of the Bible, before there were debates over one, you know, which ways of salvation are, are there, is it just Jesus or other religions, before there were debates about gender and sexuality, 
there is a debate about circumcision. And the reason that was such a hot button issue for the New Testament era was because circumcision was the way that you identified as a member of God's family, of God's covenant people. And so we're going to find that the apostles are going to continuously lay down their own, uh, their own um, um, kind, of, kind of ethnic privilege lay down their, uh, their own national aspirations, lay down their own historic Jewish identity and identity markers for the sake of the mission of Jesus. So friends, we are called to the same. We are called to the same. That we too are called to prioritize the mission of Jesus above every other earthly loyalty, whether it's our family, our ethnicity, or our, our identity as, as a nationhood, that Jesus comes first and the mission of Jesus comes first. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have aspirations for our people. It doesn't mean we don't have aspirations for our own country. I have aspirations for our country as well. But our focus is not on so much on saving our country, renewing our country, but our focus is on God's kingdom and seeing that his kingdom is being extended and seeing that his church is continuously being renewed because as the church is renewed and as the kingdom extends, that will benefit the country, right? It will benefit the people. But our priority has to be set on Jesus and the mission that Jesus has given us. And right now in our culture, as you know, there's lots of pulls, lots of voices pulling our loyalties in many directions. The book of Acts showed us how the early church stayed dead set on the Lord Jesus, focused on him, and that's to be our focus as well. Number two, number two, the early church joyfully accepted the conditions required to fulfill the mission of Jesus. They joyfully accepted the conditions that Jesus had laid down for them to successfully fulfill the mission that Jesus had called them to. And what were those conditions? Carrying a cross, enduring hardship, risking your life, losing your life for the sake of the gospel. Remember, when they, when they came back from um, their, their beating and their flogging, they rejoiced because they realized they'd been counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Where did that mentality come from? Why weren't they afraid? Why weren't they, why weren't they frustrated? Why weren't they angry with God that things seemed to be going wrong? Because Jesus had prepared them to undergo persecution and trials, to expect that and to realize that when that's happening... When that's occurring and that's going on, that means the mission is going forward. Listen to what the Lord Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. He says, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided... Here's the condition, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. In, uh, in Philippians uh, 1.29, the Apostle Paul writes, For it has been granted to you, given to you, graced to you, gifted to you, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Peter who is here in Acts chapter 5 as one of the founders of the early church. Later on in his first epistle, he writes this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You see, the early church looked at their suffering as a privilege and as a way of drawing closer to the Savior. Contrast that with 
what we hear from many Christians in our day today. When suffering comes, when trials come, when persecution comes for Christ's sake, we, we are baffled and wondering, why, well, why is this happening? And then uh, we're discouraged. We get pessimistic. We think the world is falling apart and the enemies of the church are all going to win. And then, then there, there's political maneuvering to try to get us out of suffering. Suffering is a, is a, and persecution is like an impediment to our growth. Because we think if things are hard, then it's all going to fall apart and there's no hope for our children. The apostles had a radically different perspective. One that we need to embrace. It just might be, friends, that God has purposely put us in negative world so that we may draw closer to him, depend upon him more, and be empowered to be bold witnesses in a way that we could never do in neutral or positive world. So when the pressure gets turned up, when the heat gets turned up, we're called to rejoice in the privilege that we have to suffer for his name. And finally, and this is probably the most important, the early church joyfully believed that they had an unbeatable offensive scheme against which Satan's best defensive strategies were absolutely helpless. That the church had an unbeatable offensive scheme against which Satan's defensive strategies would be absolutely helpless. Now I realize this is, this is a sports analogy here, so just hang in there with me, all right? Because the Lord Jesus himself said that not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against the church. Jesus said that. Now, if you follow the analogy that Jesus used here, gates are for what reason? Why do you put gates up? To keep people out, right? Gates are a defensive measure. You put the gates up there to, in order to keep the invading army from coming in and, and crushing you and taking over your city. Well, Jesus describes what's going on in the world as a church that is assaulting, relentlessly assaulting Satan's gates. And all Satan can do is throw as many sandbags as possible against the gates to keep heaven from invading his strongholds and his territory. So Satan does anything and everything in his power to hold the power of the gospel at bay. And that's why things are so hard. That's why there's so much turmoil. That's why there's so much um, pressure. It's Satan's defenses because he knows his time is short and the gospel is unconquerable. Friends, we tend to look at the world in the opposite way as if we're at the gates trying to hold back the forces of Satan from taking over us and our cities. That's not the way the New Testament describes the situation. Satan is a defeated foe. He will not and cannot win. He's formidable. His attacks are real. His strategies are real. His schemes are real. But in the end, Jesus is unconquerable. And his gates will break and will be defeated. So we can rest in knowing that. We can rest in the security of knowing that the victory is sure. And as negative as things may look in negative world, it's not ultimately how the story is going to end. The apostles believed that. They had nothing on their side. They didn't have any cultural protection, any institutional protection at all. All they had was the Spirit of God. And it was enough for them to step back out into those temple courts after being imprisoned, flogged, beaten, and warned that worse is to come, they step back out into those temple courts and what were they doing? Assaulting the gates of Satan by proclaiming the name of Jesus. And we're gonna find throughout the entire book of Acts, this happens again and again and again. And it isn't because there is something magical in the water for them. 
isn't because they, they were more fearless than we are. They were more ignorant or naive than we are, and they didn't count the cost as much as we do. That isn't the case. They simply believed the promises, and they lived into them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's as if they were screaming at us from the pages of the New Testament, you can do this too, because you have the same God, the same promises, and the same Spirit that they did. So friends, I want to conclude with, um, with a, a quote from you, from a historic missionary, uh, my, my, one of my heroes, historic heroes, um, Hudson Taylor. Some of you are familiar with Hudson Taylor. He's a British missionary who took the gospel to inland China in the 1800s, uh, the first Protestant missionary to go beyond the coasts of China where the Europeans still had some control and to go into uh, the dark areas of China where there was no... There was no uh, political help, and they took the gospel to, to people who, uh, who had not yet heard it before. And he wrote this. He said this, There is a need for us to give ourselves for the life of the world, as the Lord Jesus gave his own flesh to feed the lifeless souls through his life-giving bread. He says, An easygoing, non-self-denying life will never be one of power. Fruit-bearing involves cross-bearing. We know how the Lord became fruitful, not by bearing his cross merely, but by dying on it. Do we know much of fellowship with him in this? There are not two Christs, an easygoing one for easygoing Christians and a suffering, toiling one for exceptional believers. There is only one Christ. Then he asks this question. Are you willing to abide in him and thus to bear much fruit? Are you willing to abide in this Jesus, the suffering, cross-bearing Jesus, that you too would abide and bear much fruit? There are two Jesuses, kind of an easygoing one for easygoing Christians and then a cross-bearing one for, cross, for the, you know, the super Christians. No, it's one Jesus who invites all of us to carry our cross with him, suffer with him, that the world may know that this Jesus is Lord. Hudson Taylor concludes by saying this, Would that God make hell so real to us that we cannot rest. Heaven so real that we must have people there. Christ so real that our supreme motive and aim shall be to make the man of sorrows the man of joy by the conversion to him of many concerning whom he prayed in John 17 when he said, Father, I long that those whom thou hast given me may be with me where I am to see that they may see and behold my glory. May heaven be so real to us that we must have people there. Hell so real to us that we must warn people to flee the wrath to come. And Christ, the supreme motive of our lives, that we would say with him, that we would say with the Lord Jesus, we want you to come where we are so you can see his glory. That Christ may be seen by all. Friends, the apostles believed the gospel was unconquerable. And they lived with a resilient joy because they knew their mission. They knew the costs. And they also were willing to pay the price that Christ would be seen by all. I believe this is our call in negative world. This is what he's calling us to. May we walk with him and abide with him and bear much fruit for the salvation of many in this community and in this country and in the days to come no matter what the darkness may be, may we rejoice and be counted worthy to suffer for his name. Let's pray.